Hi, I'm Chris Impey, a Distinguished Professor of Astronomy and Associate Dean of Science at the University of Arizona. I work on observational cosmology, but I have a strong interest in exoplanets and astrobiology, which is the topic today. An exoplanet is a planet orbiting another star. And for centuries, astronomers speculated that the solar system was not unique, that there should be planets around all the stars you see in the sky. But we didn't know. We didn't know how to detect them. It was really hard. And in 1995, the first exoplanet was discovered. And even then, for the first decade, it was slow. It was another, a decade before maybe 100 or 200 exoplanets were discovered. But now we're finding them at, at a huge rate. And this most recent discovery is just indicative of how rapidly this field is moving. So the astronomy community, and I guess the world, are, are buzzing with this new discovery of the TRAPPIST-1 system. Uh, so it's a single system which contains seven terrestrial rocky planets, uh, all of which are Earth-like, and three of which may be habitable. And that's pretty exciting to find that all in one star system. So this discovery is significant, actually, for a number of reasons. For first of all, the, the multiplicity, the number of terrestrial planets found in one system is remarkable. In, in the solar system, there are just, you know, there's just Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. There are four terrestrial planets. And this one system has seven terrestrial planets, so more than our solar system. Uh, so that's remarkable. It has three of these seven planets in what's called the habitable zone, a range of distances from the star where water can be liquid. Uh, and that's remarkable, too, because in our solar system, pretty much the Earth is the only habitable planet. So you've got more terrestrial planets and more habitable terrestrial planets than any other star system, including our own. Another remarkable thing about this system is the fact that it's found around a wet red dwarf. So a red dwarf is just a very low mass star, in this case about 8% of the mass of the sun, which actually means it's barely a star at all. It's barely hot enough to have fusion going on. So it's very dim, 2,000 times dimmer than the sun. The advantage of looking for planets around a dwarf star is the dwarf star is a lot dimmer. Now the planets are a lot closer to this star than the planets in the solar system, inner solar system, are to the sun. But it means the contrast between the planet and the star is, is a lot more favorable for the detection of the planet. Uh, up until now, there are a number of terrestrial planets that have been found. The total count of exoplanets is almost 4,000. And there are a couple of hundred Earth-like planets. But almost all of those have been found around sun-like stars, which is how this research started. People have only been looking for planets around red dwarfs or dim, low-mass stars for a few years. But what's important is that there are about 100 red dwarfs for every sun-like star. So if you're worried about the, or interested in the census of Earth-like planets in the galaxy, there's a lot more real estate around dwarf stars than sun-like stars. So to find seven terrestrial planets around one dwarf star when there are 100 times more dwarf stars than solar stars, that's pretty exciting. That implies an awful lot of Earth-like planets in the Milky Way. So the system, the TRAPPIST-1 system, and it's worth a little aside because people think that's a rather unusual name, it's an acronym for a transiting uh, planet telescope. It's a robotic telescope uh, run by the Belgians, and so they used an acronym which also alludes to trappist Ale, which is a, it's a Cistercian monks in Belgium make this ale, so they were referring to their favorite beer as well. It's a small telescope. It's um, this big. It's like two feet across, 0.6 meters. It's really hard to see exoplanets directly by taking a picture or making an image. Uh, and so it's remarkable that you can make this kind of discovery with a small telescope. The methods by which almost all exoplanets have been found are indirect, either the Doppler method or the transit method. So until the launch of the Kepler mission, the Doppler method was the primary way we found planets. And there you don't see the planet, but the planet is tugging on the star. So you take spectra of the star and look for shifts, periodic shifts of the spectral lines, redward and then blueward and then redward with the period of the orbit. And that's how the first few hundred exoplanets were discovered. So the detection method here was the, is the transit method, where periodically, with the period of the orbit of the planet, the planet crosses the star and dims it slightly. Now that's only possible if we're looking in the equatorial plane, so all the planets are lined up such that they cross the face of the star. You could have planets in other geometries where we wouldn't see transit and we wouldn't know they existed. Each of the planets imprints its own little eclipse on the star. In the case of these planets, they were dimming the brightness of the red dwarf star by a percent or even less. So with exoplanets, the most exciting thing is when you can measure both the size of the exoplanet and its mass. 
in situations like this, the mass is measured by the Doppler technique, and the size is essentially, essentially measured by the eclipse because the, the size of the star, the cross-sectional area of the star is a fraction of the cross-sectional area of the planet is, is the ratio of those two numbers. Um, so you've got a size and you've got a mass, which actually gives you a mean density. And one of the uh, graphs in the research paper about this discovery shows that these planets do have the densities of rocky material. So we know they're not gassy planets like Neptune or Uranus. And um, we know they're not made of pure metal or anything like that. They really do look like they're rocky and possibly with water as well. A couple of them are, very, are low enough density, they might have a lot of water on them. Another striking thing about the TRAPPIST-1 system is the period of these planets. As, as we know, the Earth takes 365 days uh, to go around the sun. And even Mercury, the most rapidly orbiting planet in our solar system, takes almost three months. Well, all of these seven planets orbit in two weeks or less. And I think the fastest of the seven planets orbits in little more than a day, or two days, perhaps. So these planets are whizzing around their dwarf star. Their, their years, if you like, are actually days or weeks. That's remarkable. Of course, they have to be close to their dwarf star because they need to be close with such a feeble amount of light for water to be liquid, for them to be habitable. This discovery uh, is typical of the sort of international nature of astronomy. I, I couldn't list all the organizations, but there are 30 authors on the paper, and I think there are 24 different institutions. Most of them are in Europe. Uh, some of them are in Africa. Uh, some are in Asia. It's, it's a highly international field. Uh, the telescope, of course, that made the core discovery is run by Europeans, the Belgians in particular, but it's situated in Chile at the European Southern Observatory. NASA was involved in this because some of the critical observations were made with the Spitzer telescope, an infrared telescope in space. Relatively speaking, because space is big, this is a pretty nearby system. It's about 40 light years away. Remember, the nearest stars are about 10 times closer, four light years away. Um, so that's a pretty close exoplanet system, but it's still uh, hundreds, hundreds of trillions of miles away. Many people are aware of Breakthrough Starshot, which is a very visionary project to try and go to the nearest star system, ten times closer, with little nanobots powered by solar sails. And if they could reach five or ten percent of the speed of light, you could get to the nearest star system in a fraction of a century, maybe fifty or seventy years. So that same technology as you can see, would take centuries, maybe a millennium, to get to this system. But you could do it. You could send the probes, and they would send their information back at light speed. So it's not a ridiculous project, but it's probably not going to happen in the next few decades. So what comes next? With the discovery of a system like this, uh, terrestrial, habitable exoplanets fairly nearby in the universe, and fairly bright, so we can observe them with telescopes that aren't even a meter across, the next goal is to see not only are they habitable, but are they inhabited? In other words, is there biology there? That's a very difficult experiment, because for that you can't use an indirect technique. You actually have to measure the feeble reflected light of these little Earth-like planets that are very far away, smear that light into a spectrum, and look for what are called biomarkers, which are the spectral signatures of life. So on Earth, a biomarker would be oxygen and ozone, because the oxygen in our atmosphere was put there by microbes, by microbial life, several billion years ago. And reversing that logic, if we see oxygen, ozone, water vapor, methane, um, we could infer that there were microbial organisms on these planets altering their atmospheres. That's the experiment that people now want to do. And there's actually a prospect of doing it with the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, with the giant Magellan telescope that we're building in Chile, that the telescopes are being made at the University of Arizona, the mirrors. Um, so there are ground-based and space-based facilities that could do this experiment to detect life on these exoplanets in the next decade.